Well, welcome. We're uh, especially fortunate to have uh, uh, people here to talk about what's the issue of the day. Uh, they're kind enough to appear despite the uh, uh, problematic timing of any event at this time in December uh, at Columbia with exams approaching. Uh, but uh, it's hard to imagine any uh, current policy issue that uh, is more in people's minds than the negotiations with Iran and the fascinating uh, dynamics politically, diplomatically, and, and otherwise of what's going on. I'm uh, always bemused when I see the potent coalition of uh, Israeli and Iranian hawks doing their best to uh, torpedo the uh, recent developments. Not to uh, mention Chuck Schumer. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, uh, the panel we have here, I think, can uh, enlighten us better than uh, most people I could think of. And I have to apologize in advance that uh, being between meetings, I'm not going to be able to hear the uh, full benefit of what they have to say, which I would like to under normal circumstances. Uh, but thank you for coming. And uh, I'm hoping you have a solution, uh, in which case, of course, you get the Nobel Prize. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. I, I, um, uh, I think we should probably start right in, and I will explain a little bit about what the Iran project is. How many of you ever heard of it? Nobody. Okay. Hey. <laughs> um, the Iran project started about 12 years ago. Uh, its objective was to open up informal back-channel discussions with Iranians, and we began uh, under the auspices of the current foreign minister of Iran, who was then ambassador to the UN, uh, who organized with me a sort of set of meetings in Stockholm that were conducted for almost five years. And both Jessica uh, and uh, Gary, um, who you, I think you have their bios and you've read about them. Do you have? Do you know who they are? Do I need to introduce them? No. No. Yes. Well, I will. Um, Gary is a is a professor here. Um, probably one of SIPA's more famous, uh, popular professors who keeps winning prizes every year on his great work, and and uh, he runs uh, Gulf 2000, which is a a blog and a and a, uh, and a communi community that he set up on the internet, which is there's practically nothing like it in terms of informing the world about what um, he has learned from his uh, intense following of these issues. Um, Jessica Matthews is the uh, president of the Carnegie Endowment for Peace in Washington, D.C., and is probably one of the preeminent uh, authorities on a range of issues, the central of which is arms control, and she's been involved for many years professionally in the government, outside of the government, but she's been head of Carnegie for 15 years, what, about 15 years. Um, both uh, really top authorities on, on the issues we're going to be talking today. Uh, about today. Uh, Jessica has been uh, joined me on several of our efforts to talk to senators. Uh, she's talked frequently with our group across the country. She uh, participated in, in much of the dialogue we had. And, and since the Iran Project um, continued this, um, they, we, we started after the arrival of Ahmadinejad in 2005 as the back-channel work was shutting down with, uh, under Ahmadinejad. What we did is, is began to do whatever we could to find ways to get at Iranians, to work with the officials that we could meet, and worked on the U.S. government. Uh, so we continued to be a channel and, and a source of thinking and ideas for both governments, and continued to maintain close relations with, with each side. Then, um, in this last year, we've done a lot of publishing. We've published many reports, uh, one on military, one on sanctions, and one on diplomacy. And uh, miraculously, many of the 
hopes we put out in the diplomacy one uh, have come, have borne fruit. And much of what's happened over the um, last six months was sort of thought of as a possibility um, by our group. And our group is made up of not only the three of us, but uh, we have probably 60 or 70 prominent uh, American former diplomats, national security advisors, secretaries of state, uh, military, four-star military officers, and, and the group is quite impressive, and, and occasionally uh, Brzezinski and, and Scowcroft will sign uh, letters or op-eds that, that we've encouraged them just to, to prepare. So it's a, it's a broad coalition that represents a, 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 the old center that existed in American foreign policy, uh, Republicans and Democrats, who believe that um, reaching an agreement, or begin to talk to Iran and reach an agreement with them would be uh, an important way for us to uh, continue our work and maybe help uh, U.S. interests. Today, what I'd like to do is is ask uh, Gary uh, first to provide the setting uh, of what's happened in Iran. Why six months ago nobody thought that there would be any possibility in any near future of the type of agreement that was uh, reached in Geneva um, just a couple of weeks ago, and and. Why did that happen? Why suddenly uh, are Americans and Iranian officials speaking civilly, intelligently, uh, and hopefully about a new relationship? Um, and then after Gary gives you the setting, then Jessica will, will outline the uh, sort of structure what this agreement is and what it means. So, Gary? Okay, it's fun to be back here, and thank you all very much for, for coming. Uh, I have to say that uh, given my own background, uh, I was in the White House almost by accident when the Iranian Revolution took place and couldn't really avoid getting involved in it, and then uh, was there continuing on when the uh, American hostages were taken in Tehran and held. And uh, so I worked through that entire period. And basically, almost by default, I have been working on Iran and re Iran-related issues ever since. And in a peculiar way, you know, uh, 34 years ago, we had uh, roughly that we had this break in, in diplomatic relations, and we had a, 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 a severing of our uh, ability to talk to each other. And so, in effect, in the last 34 years, not very much has happened. So uh, for me and for people like me who have been working on this issue, and Bill and Jessica and others, uh, I should say also that Jessica and I met for the first time in the White House. We were on the National Security Council staff together. Uh, the, uh, for, for those of us who have been laboring in those fields, uh, this yeah. moment of having an actual agreement with Iran, but even more than that, just the ability for the United States and Iran to talk to each other openly and, and uh, in, in a civil manner is really a very new and exciting thing. And uh, it may not be, it may not result in the perfect agreement that everybody is would like to see, but I think it, it can't be dismissed as being uh, irrelevant at all. With regard to setting the stage, let me just say, first of all, in, in one quick sentence, the reason we are where we are, it's all about the election in Iran and the fact that Rouhani was elected uh, president of Iran in a majority vote uh, to the surprise of just about everybody, including the supreme leader of the country and others, uh, it has set the stage that make this possible. Without that, we would be right where we were uh, six months ago or eight months ago or five years ago. Let me just give a, a few words about uh, what I see, how I see Iran in sort of its domestic setting. Uh, in a strange way, uh, Iran is actually becoming or trying, well, it's been actually 
aiming to become a kind of military dictatorship with a religious king, that this has been the, the trend of events over the last few years. In that process, the Revolutionary Guards have emerged as the most powerful force uh, in Iran. So they are ultimately the arbiters of, of what goes on, what can happen. Uh, we've all noticed, those of us who work on this issue, that after this, that in the course of this deal, the negotiation and afterwards, they have been silent. They haven't really said a word. And that's the best thing we could hope for. They were certainly not going to be cheering uh, an agreement like this because, in fact, their interests in many ways are helped by the sanctions. I mean, a lot of us who were, uh, had some qualms about the way things were going on the political side realized that the Revolutionary Guards, who are the ones who run the smuggling ports, are the <coughs> ones who get a cut on stuff that comes into the country illegally, uh, who are, because there's no foreign investment, are given the task of working on the oil industry, uh, building subways in Tehran, uh, building airports, running uh, communications uh, companies. They've been making a lot of money on this. And so when the Revolutionary Guards look at some kind of a deal which may bring foreign currency come flooding back into Iran, they have to look at their portfolio and say, you know, maybe this isn't such a good thing for us. So having the Revolutionary Guards quiet is a good thing. Let me just say a couple of words about what the revolution has done and what it hasn't done. Uh, the, the Iranian Revolution, which was really dates from 1979, has done a few things right. Uh, there are now roads where there were no roads, villages that have electricity and gas that didn't have it before, <coughs> people out in the boondocks, basically, who have access to education up to and including university level education who didn't before. Uh, there's a good health care system. Uh, there are things that have been done that are, that actually are perceived by people at a lower level uh, in Iran as being a very good thing. And that's basically where the revolution draws its support. Uh, the, at the same time, the revolution and the rule of the mullahs, the clerical rule, has done many things wrong. Today, uh, basically, they, they have never been able to manage the economy. It's a stagnant economy. It's never worked properly. Uh, the, the people who come into it are, in many cases, promoted because they, they're clerics or because they're friends of clerics or because they're family, uh, a lot of nepotism and the like, a tremendous amount of corruption. And the system has never really functioned properly. So you have rampant uh, inflation, uh, poor job creation, and Everything is based on, you know, family associations and ties, who you know, rather than a merit-based system. And that's not unique to Iran, but it's an extreme case. And so there, many people who live there are very much aware of the weaknesses of the system. They see it every day. The supreme leader himself is not so supreme. Uh, basically, he is a very insecure individual. He, when he got that job in the first place, his credentials really weren't as good as, as some other people. It certainly could not be compared to his predecessor, Ayatollah Khomeini, who was the founder of the revolution, the leader of the revolution. Uh, he's just not in the same uh, category. And so he has spent much of these last years, many years, trying to firm up his own coalition and support. That is what he works on. And that is more, that is his first interest, and that's what he's interested in to begin with. Everything else follows from that. I have argued, and many people disagree with me, but I have argued that the, uh, that in fact the Supreme, that the Supreme Leader needs the Revolutionary Guards more than they need him. That's never really been put to the test, but every time the Revolutionary Guards come out with a uh, position that goes off at an angle from the official position of the government, the supreme leader tends to go along with it. And I think it's a pretty good indicator that, in fact, he is not killed. Basically, this is a man who leads from behind, literally. Um, when a new president comes in, typically the supreme leader gives him some running room, uh, typically a year, two years for sure, to basically try to put a new program in place. Usually the 
the new leader, the new president, was elected for a reason. And uh, uh, actually, let me just explain for a little bit. Iran has a population, and this may be something that you're not really familiar with. Iran has a population that is quite rebellious. This is a, a population that has had, you could easily call it three revolutions in a century, which is a pretty good rec record for any country anywhere, actually, in terms of rebelliousness. They had a constitutional revolution in the early part of the 20th century. They had the Mossadegh attempted takeover, in effect, that almost got rid of the Shah in 1953. And then they had a full-blown popular revolution in 1979. That's, uh, that's quite a record, actually. Uh, and if you look at it in comparison to any other country in the Middle East, there's nobody even close. Iran's population is well-educated. They are politically astute and interested in what's going on. And they really pay attention. So what happened in this last election was what has happened in a number of previous elections. Iran doesn't have free elections. They certainly don't have a primary system. Their <laughs> primaries are basically, it's open to anybody who wants to apply. So they often typically have 600 or more people who apply to run for president. Most of them, people just did it for a whim, uh, crazy people, people off the street, uh, homeless people with nothing better to do. <laughs> But there is, but then some serious people as well, and there's no way of sorting that out. So the supreme, uh, the uh, assembly, the, uh, the the guardian council, meets and decides who's really qualified to run for president and who isn't. Well, needless to say, that has a political quotient in it, and so they basically throw out, you know, 99.9% .9 of the people who applied, and end up with a handful of people who look pretty familiar. They, 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 they're not always clerics, but they often are, and they usually have a pedigree that goes back. That happens in election after election. The Iranian people look at that array and judge it. So you have, as a typical thing, although the, it's a narrow spectrum, you have people over here who basically are ultra-rightist and absolutely you know, uh, in line with the the, uh, the uh, Revolutionary Guard and the hardline positions. And then you have people in the middle who may be more ambiguous. And on the other end of this narrow spectrum, you have people who are relatively anti-establishment. They are at least willing to criticize the existing regime. Without exception, the Iranian people vote for that person. So they have, as I say, they don't have much to choose from. It's, it's a limited spectrum. But within that spectrum, they always choose the same person, and that is the person that they think is actually working to change the system. The Iranian people have lived there now for a long, you know, in, in this, under this regime for well over 30 years, and a lot of people in Iran are perfectly aware that the emperor really has no clothes. They know that this system is not functioning very well and that they're looking for change. So having said that, does that mean that Iran is about to collapse, that uh, politically it's about to, to fall apart? It really doesn't. Um, institutions, governments that are, uh, that have, you know, where, where they're perceived to be less than good managers and also much more interested in their own personal power than they are in the good of society, those, if, if, they're, if they're prepared to be ruthless, uh, societies, uh, governments like that can last a very long time. I give you the, the uh, when Stalin took over, particularly in, in the 1930s, uh, he was, uh, it, it was very clear that communism became a slogan and not re a reality in terms of what they were trying to do. It was all about who was in power and who was running the show. And people very quickly realized that that's what was going on. But the system went on for another 50 years. So you don't write the Iranian system off necessarily because people have been uh, disaffected and don't like it too much. Um, the, let me just say a word about sanctions because everybody thinks about sanctions. Sanctions have hurt Iran. They really have seriously hurt Iran. It's made their economic problems worse 
than they would have been otherwise. On the other hand, the people who say they only came to the table because of the sanctions are really wrong. It just isn't that simple. If you really go back and look, just 10 years ago, we had two Iranians who were leading a negotiating team that made an offer to the European Union that looks ex very much like the offer that is on the table today. Those two people were Rouhani and Zarif, who are now the president and the foreign minister. They were fired by Ahmadinejad and uh, left out in the cold for a period of eight years or more. They are now back, and they're making the same offer uh, in much the same way. The sanctions 10 years ago were much less severe than they are now. If this is all about the sanctions, why are they, why are they making the same offer? Why is it the same people again? The reality is these are the best people that Iran has to offer, and they know that Iran is not going to be able to pull out of the doldrums. Its government is never going to be able to succeed as they would like unless they resolve some of these problems about opening up to the outside world. That's going to be very controversial uh, within Iran, just as there are people in the United States who really don't want to see a change. They like things the way they are. There are people in Iran who feel very much the same way, and that's where the battle is really going to be joined. Uh, I could say a lot more, but let me just stop there, because I think that's a jumping off point where uh, Jessica can take over and talk about, okay, what what we're doing now with regard to the sanction, with regard to the uh, deal, and then I'm sure you will have questions about various aspects, and we can expand on okay, that. Okay, um, let me just say I didn't tell you who I was. I'm uh, who I am. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm Bill Lures, uh, friends of these two, and I, I, among other things, I was a former diplomat and uh, and uh, former president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and and uh, now an adjunct professor here at SEPA. So. Um, teaching a sort of quiet little course talk, talking to the enemy, which I learned a lot from this experience with Iran on that subject. Jessica. Okay. Um, so let me try to um, describe for you what's in the deal and, um, uh, and what may come next. Um, I, I will start by, by saying, A, I think for the reasons um, that Gary began with, as well as for the content of the um, of the of the agreement, this is an historic deal. Um, this is an historic. Uh, uh, this holds the promise of not only resolving an enormous, probably our biggest security uh, concern, um, uh, but of changing the dynamics across the Middle East in uh, in, in ways that um, that we can talk about. I would say also that it is a much better deal than anybody thought we could get three months ago. Um, uh, there were several elements of it that were expected, um, that, that people thought would be in a first phase deal uh, that, that would be uh, uh, acceptable. Um, one was that Iran would agree to stop producing 20% enriched uranium. Um, you may know that 3 to 5% is what's called low enriched uranium. It's what you use in a reactor, in a power reactor. 93% enriched uranium is what you use in, in a nuclear weapon. But it's not linear. The amount of work it takes to go from 20% to 93% is much less than what it takes to go from 0.7% with the ore that you take out of the ground to 3.5%. So 20% is way far along um, uh, towards high enriched weapons usable fissile material. So the it was expected an agreement would have to include an Iranian commitment to not produce any more 20 percent uh, enriched uranium. That it would ban the operation or the further installation of advanced centrifuges. The amount of work it takes to enrich uranium depends on how high-tech your centrifuges are and how many, how many of them you need is very much a function of how, how advanced they are. And third, it was assumed that the agreement would have to prevent 
the fueling or the operation of a plutonium production reactor in a place called Arak. Um, uh, this agreement does all three of those things, but it does a whole lot more. And let me sketch for you what that is. The Iranians have agreed that um, no further centrifuges will be built except to replace broken ones. So the total number of centrifuges stays constant. That there will be no further accumulation of 5% power reactor level enriched uranium. That, um, that is a big surprise, and it's important because that means you've taken uh, stuff from 0.7% up to 5%. You've put a lot of enrichment into that. If they keep on enriching during this six months, which they will, what they have to do is take the stuff they're producing and convert it to a form called oxide, which you, from which you cannot further enrich. You, you, in, the only way you can enrich is in a gaseous form, which is fed into the centrifuge. If you oxidize it, make it into an oxide, you've taken a big step away from further enrichment. Third, they, they have agreed to uh, not to test or to produce fuel or any new components for the ARIC reactor, and to provide to the IAEA design information on the reactor, which the IAEA has been asking for for eight years. Um, it's very important both for understanding what the capabilities of the reactor are and also how to effectively monitor it and verify what's going on in it, and also to understand what they were up to to begin with. Um, fourth or fifth, I guess, they um, have agreed to eliminate altogether their existing stock of 20 percent enriched uranium. Um, you may remember when Netanyahu spoke at the UN two years ago, um, and he held up that sort of cartoon of a bomb and it had a red line across it, and he said, and the red line here is 250 kilograms of 20 percent enriched uranium. So the, the, the Iranians have just agreed to go to zero. Um, and so the, either they have to dilute from 20 percent back down to below five, uh, what's called blending down the, the, the existing stock, or they have to convert it to oxide or some combination of that. Um, and sixth, they have agreed to extremely intrusive verification and monitoring conditions, including daily access to a whole bunch of the key uh, facilities. And they have agreed to extend those, ver those monitoring <coughs> to a whole bunch of currently unmonitored facilities, including uranium mines, milling, <coughs> milling, uranium milling operations, facilities for constructing centrifuges and for assembling them and for nuclear storage. So the, the verification regime is, um, <coughs> is vastly broader and deeper and more intrusive than um, uh, any, uh, I think anybody uh, expected. So, um, so what doesn't it do? Well, it doesn't stop Iranian enrichment. And that brings up this business which you hear so much about, but which I think is a red herring, is about the quote unquote right to enrich. The Nonproliferation Treaty, which is the only legal basis on which all of this is, sits, doesn't say anything about rights uh, to do anything. Um, what it does say, or specifically with respect to either enrichment or plutonium production, it says you have in the context of a peaceful program, a country has the right to all nuclear technologies. This, by the way, was a mistake <laughs> when the, when, when the, when the um, treaty was, was uh, negotiated in 1968, but that's a different story. Um, uh, so it doesn't give them a right one way or another. Um, and we have very good reason for believing that this is not a peaceful program. So, um, and of course, and this agreement does not say Iran has a right to enrich. They're interpreting the fact that the agreement allows them to continue enriching 
as that we recognize their right to this um, technology. And, uh, and of course, it is true that there are currently 13 other countries in the world that are carrying out uranium enrichment. Um, all the nuclear weapon states except maybe Israel, we, uh, there's divided view on that, so call that eight. Um, the Netherlands, uh, Brazil, Argentina, um, South Korea, it's a group. So the question about if Iran does indeed have a program that we're all convinced is now or going to be peaceful, there would be a question about why they couldn't, right, in the context of 13 other countries <coughs> doing so. Um, so it doesn't stop enrichment. It doesn't say anything about weapons-related research and development. Um, everything in the agreement has to do with the nuclear fuel cycle, the, the reactor-related fuel cycle. And it doesn't substantially lengthen the time, it does somewhat, but not as much as we would hope, for a, a, a possible breakout, a dash by Iran where they just throw up and say, kick out the inspectors and dash, try to dash towards the weapon. Um, all of that is stuff that has to be dealt with in the final agreement. Okay, so what about the criticisms? In my view, they fall into three, maybe four categories. The first category is, I haven't read it. And there are a whole lot of the criticisms that you hear and read that fall into that category. Um, uh, I would say that Netanyahu's original comment, this is a Christmas present for Iran, fell into that category. He really, really hadn't read this thing when they first started leaping all over it. A lot of the Republican comments, uh, uh, Senator Corker after the president um, announced in the middle of the night Saturday the deal tweeted, there's no limit to what the White House will do to distract attention from Obamacare. That was his <laughs> comment on a really offensive, uh, at least to me. Um, the second category is, um, I don't want a deal. And there you can conjure up a whole lot of things that could go wrong, and some of them are, you know, are quite real. Um, uh, but, but you have to kind of um, parse what is behind those, those um, uh, imaginings of the things that could go wrong. And the third, the sort of broadest category is I really don't trust these bastards and either they'll cheat or um, there will be some other reason that this thing will fail or they'll, they'll negotiate better than we do um, and so I don't, I don't like this deal. Um, but more specifically, um, there are those who say we'll never get to a final deal um, because um, the sanctions will erode, uh, the sanctions regime will erode, the uh, Iranians um, won't agree. But one thing that's tremendously important that is in the deal is an explicit commitment about the final deal that says everything will be agreed or nothing will be agreed. So they have both sides agreed to uh, an all or nothing deal. So it can't be chipped away at. Um, uh, and secondly, of course, um, uh, we gave actually very little on sanctions relief in this first deal. So almost all the leverage of these sanctions, the banking and the financial sanctions in particular, is still in place. So to the degree to which the Iranians want relief from that, and uh, you know, I agree with Gary completely, it's partly that, it's heavily that. I mean, these, these have been brutally effective sanctions and their economy is really hurting, but they also want reintegration with the world and it's very clear um, from what's happening, uh, not in the street so much as, I mean, not literally in the street anymore, but that, that the Iranian population would like to come in from the cold. Um, 
There are those who argue, and it's a different version of this same criticism, it was a terrible mistake to go for a partial deal, an interim deal. We should have gone for one deal because we'll never get the final this way. Well, there's lots of answers to that. One is um, the length of time it would have taken to negotiate a final deal, the Iranians would have been enriching full steam ahead, and the, the program would have gotten dangerously close to, uh, to a breakout point, um, which is what has been happening for the last umpteen years. Um, but there are also other really important things. Well, I, I think it's pretty clear that, ni that we, the U.S., wouldn't have been politically ready to swallow a full deal. Um, it's going to take, I think, a couple of, it's going to take a while to sink in um, <coughs> after 34 years of estrangement. And on Capitol Hill, I will tell you that, you know, Iran is like a two-dimensional evil car caricature. Um, um, and so I, I think, uh, it, certainly in the U.S. and probably also in Tehran, it would have been extremely difficult to try to go from a to Z in one in one step, um, uh, and um, and then the third set of criticisms has to do with the belief that they'll cheat. But you have to. I mean, I think the most important answer to that is to ask yourself why. I mean, why would they do what they have done? Give a whole lot more than they got. Bring the eyes of the world, literally and figuratively on ex everything that they're doing, except unprecedentedly intrusive m monitoring, which makes it vastly harder to break out and to cheat, only in order to cheat. They might, if you, know, if you think they're really um, sort of terminally um, A, smarter than we are, and B, I, I can't think of quite the right, the right adjective, but Devious. Uh, they, devious, thank you. They, they might have covert facilities <coughs> we still don't know anything about. But on the other hand, they have them already. So why would they invite this process which, um, uh, which, will make, uh, which makes it so much harder to cheat without earning global appropriate? Um, and let me just f finish then with, with two comments on, on the sanctions. W one is that this, uh, on, on economic grounds, the sanctions have been incredibly effective. But they have only been effective uh, when they have been multilateral. And they are only multilateral because of Obama's outreach at the beginning of his first term. We made the Cairo speech and then the Nauru's message to the Iranians and said, we're ready to hold out a hand if you're ready to unclench your fist, um, that convinced the world that the U.S. was not the bad guy here, um, which much of the world thought was the case before, that we were in the wrong, they were right both about enrichment and about this, you know, a very unclear situation of what it was they were doing. Um, so that situation if the Congress either kills the deal by, oh, and I, I forgot to mention one other el key element of this deal. It says the U.S. commits itself not to add any new nuclear-related sanctions during the course of the six months. So if the Congress does that, or if it sets up um, an a bar for the final deal that's impossible to reach, um, in such a way that the rest of the world says, these guys were right all along, it's the U.S. that doesn't want a deal. Then indeed the sanctions regime will unravel rather quickly. And uh, it's probably worth also noting that the sanctions regime is on infirm ground already. Uh, India, Turkey, China, all of them want to be um, back buying Iranian oil. Um, so the, but the effective, economic effectiveness of the, of, the, of the sanctions, the leverage that they give us depends on them being multilateral and the multilateral support for the sanctions, which are unprecedented, depends on the world believing that Iran is the bad guy. 
because of what it's doing. The second thing to remember about sanctions is that while they have been very effective at slowing the program, they cannot stop it. So 2005, the Iranians made an offer to cap their program at 3,000 centrifuges. By the time George Bush left office, they had more than 7,000 centrifuges. We, we didn't accept that deal. Today, they have more than 19,000 centrifuges. A lot of facts on the ground have happened over the course of these 10 years. Um, even in the period of the most severe sanctions, since the beginning of the Obama administration, the Iranian stockpile has gone from about 1,000 kilograms to more than 10,000 kilograms. So the people who say, well, we just have to, you know, the sanctions got them to the table, now we just have to squeeze more, harder, tighter, longer, and we'll get the perfect deal, are wrong, <coughs> are wrong. The sanctions cannot stop their program. And the more leverage we seek to get with the sanctions, the more facts on the ground the Iranians are going to do. So um, uh, this is not a negotiation to get a perfect deal. We're not going to get a perfect deal. Uh, it is a, a, a negotiation to get a good deal. Uh, and the surprising thing, I think, um, is how good a deal we've got now. Um, the hard part is, I mean, many uh, uh, people, it's very easy to say the hard part is still to come. Actually, this, I think, in some ways you could say this was as hard a part as, as any, the breakthrough of going from um, uh, <coughs> total freeze to being able to trust each other enough to get a deal. We'll see. There's still plenty of ways the thing could fail. Could I just plenty of things. Plenty of ways. So let me stop there. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, I'd just like to add one word. If you're thinking about sort of where you go from here, because we've got this uh, six-month period begins probably around the 1st of January and goes on for six months to try to get a final deal. And I agree completely with Jessica that basically we've gone an enormous distance in that direction, much further than almost any of us would have dreamed possible. But if you think about what are you going to be arguing about between now and June, uh, which uh, call that the, the cutoff point. Basically, you want to talk about how many centrifuges does Iran have and what type. Those are numbers. That's going to be controversial. You'll argue about it, but that's a, you know, you can put that out and, and look at it. And th they, how many inspectors do you have on place and how, how much access do they have uh, overall? That is the other side of the coin. And then you have what I think are basically secondary things like what about the plutonium reactor at Arak? Are you prepared to make technical changes to it that make it less dangerous in terms of plutonium production? And also when you put promises not to reprocess, which they would have to do even if they produce plutonium. So if, if you promise not to put in reprocessing plants and you, can, you have people there watching you as you do it, then even the production of plutonium is less dangerous than it would have been otherwise. So those are the three things. The issue about right of you know the, the right to enrich, basically that's been resolved. That's that's in the present uh, issue, and people argue about it. But the reality is, everybody knows that Iran is going to continue enriching. So you have how many centrifuges? What is the size of the stockpile that is prepared that you're prepared to accept on a regular basis? How many inspectors do you have? And what are you going to do to fix Iraq? Now, those are tough issues. But I think you can look at that and say, that should be not an impossibility in a, you know, the next six months, given the fact that we solved the, so many of those issues in the first six weeks, basically, of after the uh, Rouhani election. So uh, I, it is quite common to say the hardest part is yet to come, and I share uh, Jessica's view that maybe that's not really true, that maybe the, the hardest part is already past us, and that in one respect, viewed from my own perspective, as somebody who's been watching this all this time and is aware intensely that the United States and Iran haven't been talking to each other, in one respect, the game is already over because 
I don't think we're ever going to go back to a situation where we won't talk to Iran again. And if we can talk to them, we have an opportunity to actually work something out, which was absolutely not true before. So that has changed the whole nature of the game as we go forward. Thank you. Let me say a couple of things. Before I say them, I want to introduce two more people. Iris Bietti and, and Suzanne Toma. Iris is my deputy who has been working with me side by side in this program. And they happen to be, and Suzanne, we've just taken on to help us. And uh, they both happen to be SEPA graduates. So that's how SEPA this this whole thing is. Um, <coughs> let me add just a couple things to what the two of them said. First, I think Jessica outlined that what we're looking at now are all reversible uh, decisions that have been taken by both sides. They've been set up so that if it if it they can't get the whole deal, all these decisions that they've taken, particularly with regard to access and constraints on their program, can be reversed, can be stopped. Um, but likewise, if you get to the point where you're going to make them permanent, which is the idea of this comp comprehensive agreement, it changes a lot of things because they have to commit to undertake certain projects which will reduce significantly, and both Jessica and, and Gary outlined what those might be, but they will be irreversible. So they're going to have to commit. And the, um, the agreement will not mean anything to us until they do that, uh, including physical changes. Um, but the other side of that is the United States has to commit. We have to say, okay, we're lifting sanctions which sanctions, how many, uh, how they're phased in, how they're phased out, rather, will probably be some of the negotiations because it's going to take the United States a long time to unravel sanctions which are so severe and so effective. Um, the most important are the banking sanctions, obviously the oil limitations on oil imports, and certainly the question of investment within Iran, which they're looking for, and technology. Um, all those are going to be very tough to bargain and tough for the United States to change. Uh, it takes, it's taken us decades to get rid of the sanctions we had against the Soviet Union. And uh, practically every country we ever enter into with sanctions, it becomes uh, a difficult, long process, and it becomes very political. Um, the residue of dislike hatred for Iran will continue for a long time in the U.S. Congress. And to the extent that the President needs Congress to go along, it's going to take a while. <coughs> so I guess what worries me is, although the deal looks real, and there is a possibility that within a few months, within six months to a year, we could have a whole new world, not only in our dealings with Iran, but how that dealings with Iran without a nuclear potential means for our relations with all the other countries in the world, most certainly Israel and Saudi Arabia, who are, and what it means in terms of how the United States and Iran might possibly cooperate in Syria. Um, they have a high, Syria, the, the Iranians have a high motivation to work with other countries, including the United States, to deal with this, the Sunni jihadist movement that is growing. Um, Iraq, there has to be a way to, to reduce the, terror, the rising terror in that country. We and Iran both have a common interest in that happening. And, and Afghanistan, the whole future of Afghanistan after we leave is up in the air. And it's every bit as important to, uh, to Iran than it is to us. And they sort of live, they're, they're, they're bordering state, and they're, 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 many of them speak Farsi in, in Afghanistan. So this is not a done deal, but if it is, it has to be complete. And to be complete, the United States is going to have to deal with the issue of sanctions, which is going to be extremely difficult. And I would hate to see the time when we are the ones who can't deliver on our side of the deal. Uh, OK. Any, any questions, or have we answered? Yes, sir. Why don't you tell me who you are, sir? Oh, yeah, I'm Joe Harris. Uh, I'm not at this school, but this school. 
it's you know the media and you know recently has been giving us the, the uh, what the back channel discussions politically have been going on you know over the years before this uh, last six months and we haven't heard you know anything about the Gary Sims <coughs> and the Valerie Nassau's and the Miss Matthews and Lurs you know they're coming out of academic in terms of back channel so it's been very interesting to hear that finally even though the media hasn't you know put it out yet now are you optimistic as I am that this evolving uh, between the United States and Iran will trump the uh, Israeli uh, lobby uh, for all the reasons that uh, Ms. Matthews have said? You know, I mean, the world wants it. I mean, we talk about the West, the United States, the East, South, everything, you know, and the, the tremendous necessity of, you know, for it, and the United States strongly wants it, and Iran strongly wants it. So it seems to me that the major powerful opposition to it is still the Israeli lobby. And I think that's going to be trumped. And I want your opinion too. This, I mean, this, this is a question, I want your opinion. I think that's the, the evolving rapprochement and the strength around it for it in the world, and in Iran, and everything else, like I mentioned, is so strong, I think it's going to trump the Israeli lobby, which I think is the really the only major opposition. Jessica will answer this because she knows, I don't. <laughs> but I will say that uh, in, in my years, including going back fighting for the Jackson, against the Jackson Bannock Amendment in the, in the uh, God knows, <coughs> 70s, I've been at this dealing with uh, this issue in the Senate of the United States, and I have never seen it like it is today, never. There's never been a, such a close alignment between APAC, Israel's interests, and uh, the uh, opposition to any deal with Iran that I've, in, in our history. So whether going head to head with the President of the United States in the U.S. Senate, uh, BB will win or lose is, is the big question. And uh, my sense is that uh, with such things as what happened yesterday with Henry Kissinger and George Schultz coming yeah. up firmly in favor. Well, Schultz is always, you know, taking that kind of position. No, he hasn't. Schultz has been, both of them have been fuzzy on this, and they declared themselves. But I, Jessica, positively. How you, yeah, declared on the right side. I, they, they came out, this article is very positive. The yes, ending. Is. Oh, yeah. Read the ending. Read the last five paragraphs. Don't read anything else. Forget the rest of the okay. Read it from the bottom up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you're more optimistic than I am. Um, one consequence of the recent Supreme Court decision on, on uh, campaign finance and of the, is that today the political parties play a much smaller role in raising money for congressional <coughs> candidates than the candidates do themselves. And therefore, individual giving is vastly more important. And that has raised Apex clout to an incredible <laughs> degree. And also, people have gotten used, you know, it has been 30 plus years in which it was a sort of a knee jerk, easy, um, uh, cost free. A position to dump on Iran. And, you know, Ahmadinejad made it a whole lot easier. But, um, so this was a cheap, easy way to cultivate um, uh, Jewish support. And it became also a sort of an annual um, uh, performance at the APAC convention, which has about 12,000 people in Washington, um, for people to go, candidates to go, and compete with each other to say more and more and more and more, uh, you know, negative stuff. So people in the, on, in the Hill, are by and large, um, uh, have a kind of, it's, Iran is like a two-dimensional caricature of evil. And they're also used to this knee-jerk kind of thing. And, and, and because of the really horrible state of our campaign finance laws, 
APAC has even more cloud than it has ever had. So for all those reasons, I believe that probably in order to get a good outcome of this, there will have to be a signal from Jerusalem that makes it possible. Because I don't think it's there otherwise. It, the merits quite apart. And we haven't even talked about you know, what, the, what the outcome could be for the region. I mean, when you look at both Syria and Afghanistan, and at the troubles in Iraq, there are, there are lots of ways in which U.S. and Iranian interests could converge coming year. But the merits aside, I, I don't think it's there. Can I say a word? Yeah, well, you, you've raised a question that concerns all three of us a lot. So. Absolutely. That, let me just say, I mean, and Jessica's right, I mean, to, the, the merits aside, but the merits aren't aside. I mean, the merits are really there. And if I'm moderately more uh, optimistic than either of my two colleagues, it's probably because I don't spend a lot of time in Washington. Uh, <laughs> and therefore, I can afford to stand back and be more objective about the whole thing instead of getting wire brushed by congressmen and senators every day um, in terms of the, their views on what's in fact going on. But let me, since it was raised before, and I know Bill is very much uh, aware of this too, uh, I, let's take as an example in terms of the, the possibility of coming out on the right side of this whole thing. Let's take that piece by uh, Kissinger and Schultz, uh, which appeared what, yesterday uh, in the Wall Street Journal. And I think it's Today's the... Been. I think it's no, the, yes, yes. it's the yeah. second it's the second paragraph or the third paragraph from the end, and let me just quote it to you because it really is important. These are two guys now who are writing a piece for the Wall Street Journal op-ed page, which is completely opposed to this deal, and the first two thirds of that piece are as negative as you could get, without getting very specific. But they're they're sort of unhappy about all of everything that goes on. And if you quit reading about two-thirds of the way down, you'd say these guys are absolutely opposed to a deal. Let me read you what they say when they come to their conclusion about after all of the problems that they've raised. They say American diplomacy now has three major tasks. One, to define a level of Iranian nuclear capability limited to plausible civilian uses and to achieve safeguards to ensure that this level is not exceeded. Okay, that's where we're at, right? to leave open the possibility of a genuinely constructive relationship with Iran. Good heavens. You know, we're worrying about keeping a constructive relationship with Iran and to design a Middle East policy adjusted to new circumstances. In other words, we expect things to change and we're going to have to adjust to it. Now that is, if, if Obama had written that, he could have because that's exactly what he's doing, and that's exactly what he wants. And if that's the case, and you've got to remember the other key fact in this whole thing, and that is that this deal was signed off not just by the Americans. We talk about us and them, but talking about the Iranians. The U.S. is extremely important in this. But we also had the French, the Germans, the British, the, you know, the Russians, the Chinese, and the European Union. They also have their signature on this deal. And if the United States, or Israel for that matter, really begins to back away seriously from what is clearly a good deal, there's, it's not going to be that easy. And I look at what Netanyahu did right off the bat, first when Rouhani was elected, he came out and immediately said, oh, don't pay any attention to it, he's a uh, wolf, wolf in sheep's time. clothing. And then when the deal was actually announced, he says this is a terrible deal, a bad deal, and so forth. And he sort of backed off that. He is not as loud on that subject as he's been before. Why? Because there really aren't any arguments on that side. There really isn't a basis for maintaining that position other than just sort of an emotional reaction. So I have watching that process, I have slightly more optimism that the facts and the merits will, in fact, overcome the, the sheer politics of the thing. But I've been wrong about this kind of thing in the past, and I never underestimate Washington's ability to get it wrong. So, 
Well, on that point, we're uh, a group of uh, organizations in Washington across the country are going to form a broad coalition to work hard to make sure that his optimistic view takes place because it's going to need a lot of push from all those people who think that this is an excellent deal for the United States to say it and to get more and more <coughs> members of Congress uh, willing to speak up. Uh, there are not many now. Over the next six months, hopefully there'll be more. So anything you can do to help? Yeah, public opinion will yeah. really matter. Yeah. And, <coughs> and Schumer in particular should hear from all of you. Yeah. Exactly. I've written him twice in the last two days. Who so else? Yeah. Any question? Yes. Sorry. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Oh, uh, Orange Erickus, I'm a refugee from the old Russian Institute. And so my perspective was somewhat of an innocent. I'm an old refugee at the Russian Institute myself, so. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, that's a, that's a, that has nothing to do with the Russian Institute. Okay. Do with I have uh, regarded myself as a, rather a neutral observer. They say when you negotiate with people, you should understand your opponent's position as well as you do your own. And if we look at these whole problems from the standpoint of a reasonably enlightened citizen of Iran, how does he look at it? He remembers that the CIA overthrew Mossadegh. He remembers that the United States, with Saddam Hussein of all things, uh, attacked Iran and caused a war that killed something close to a million people, I believe. 200. Okay, yeah, go ahead. That's close to it anyway, and certainly, and uh, uh, nobody attacks North Korea. They have atom bombs, and Iran had an atom bomb under, uh, uh, in those periods, nothing would have happened. And quite apart from all of that, under this geopolitics, Iran is surrounded by atomic powers, India, Pakistan, Israel, Russia, and of course the United States. So maybe they should have an atom bomb, what do you think? Well, you know, I ran a, uh, right in this room, a few years ago, uh, before this, before Ahmadinejad, actually, I ran a series of seminars in which we brought Iranian nuclear specialists, people who ran their nuclear program, who were technically involved in what was going on, and brought them together in this room, actually, with people who were uh, nonproliferation specialists in the United States and strategic types who work on these issues. And it was kind of an interesting experience because the Iranians came in and said, we don't want a bomb. We're interested in peaceful development. We're interested in nuclear power. We are insisting on our right to be able to enrich, but we don't want a nuclear weapon. And the uh, Americans, uh, in particular, the strategic types, sat around the table and they said, you know, if I were in your shoes, I would want a nuclear weapon. This is, I, I, you know, I would absolutely go for it right now. And as a result, I don't trust a word that you say. Because I, and, and all of these Iranians went back with a kind of baffled look on their face at the end of this, uh, at the end of these several days of, of uh, rather intensive discussions. Uh, and actually the hardliners in Iran actually use those arguments. They quote American specialists as saying, you know, boy, you know, this, if you want to protect yourself, this is the way to do it, and you'd be much better off with it. That has actually been a problem for us. But the reality is that the typical, historically, for a country that wants to build a nuclear weapon, even covertly, it's about seven years from start to stop, from the time you take a decision until you actually have an explosive device in hand. You can argue about when Iran started its process, but it was probably in the mid-1980s. That's when they took their decision to go for a nuclear program in Iran. Now, what is the matter with the Iranians that they've been all, ever since 1986, they haven't managed to build a nuclear weapon when Pakistan did it from a standing start without anything like Iran's, you know, technological capabilities or infrastructure. You know, other countries did it as well. What's the matter with the Iranians? 
you really do have to stop at some point and say, maybe they really don't want to build a nuclear weapon. And I think if you really want to look at why they're negotiating right now and why they're prepared to give us as much as they are, is that basically they are prepared to give that up because that's not their principal objective. They would, and I insist on this, they would like the rest of the world to know, as we all do, that if they, if somebody attacks them, they have the capacity to build a nuclear weapon. They have, they have the ability to respond. And that's the thing that bothers Israel more than anything else, is not that Iran has a secret nuclear weapon, but that they have the understanding, knowledge, capability to build a bomb if they decided they needed one. And, and, and from Netanyahu's position, that's unacceptable. But the reality is, you know, what there are 14 countries, 15 countries in the world that have that capability, uh, and you can't walk the dog back. It basically, once they know how to do it and they've learned how to do it, there's no turning that back. So that's my take on it, that, that, and that they're going to insist on being a member of that club that has the cap capability. Okay. Question back there? Yes. Yes, go ahead. You. Yeah, me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm just a citizen. Yeah. But I, I read the papers carefully. You what? Uh, first of all, there's pros and cons in making a deal. The what? There's pros, pros and cons. And cons. There's, yes. There's advantages for both sides and disadvantages sure. for both sides. <coughs> you just have to weigh on your side, are we getting an advantage or are we not? You don't want to war, you don't have to bomb them. We'll see what they do. But the big test here is our president's willingness to be tough when the time comes. I lived long enough, career, nobody expected a war there. We weren't prepared, World War II, we had some nondescript people in Japan, not prepared. They come across, but you can't think to the other person. You people are saying, well, if the Iranians are thinking this, they're thinking that, but we don't live in Iran. We don't know their cultural history, we don't know their religion, we don't know how they think. But we're thinking for them. That's dangerous. You never, never know what the other side is thinking. They're like they don't know how we're thinking. They say, oh, these guys are soft, we can get away with it. But after a while, America does something up and says, enough is enough. And do well, so, let, let me, let me, just, let me try to answer. It. Yeah, I'm sorry. And, the, and that's the APEC and the lobby, Israeli lobby. That I, that, that's a code word of any war. Those Jews are trying to take over the government. Take on that. It's not a lot. It's a lot. It's a. It's, they don't take their orders from the ten young. They can deal with them and find out what's going on, but they don't take orders. They're American citizens, just like us. They're not doing anything illegal. And now I want to use that. Well, let me let me deal with the first issue first. Uh, the yes, we obviously have to know as much as we can about their motivation and we have to learn as we go along how we verify the agreement we reach. Um, nobody goes into any negotiations of this serious a nature with so much at stake without making sure as you go along you can reach agreement we think that they are going to achieve that that agreement provides us and the world the security that we're looking for and that it's verifiable. And uh, so I, I think you can rest assured that with all these years, even though you're right, we don't know nearly as much about Iran as, say, Zarif, the foreign minister of Iran, got a PhD from University of Denver uh, and uh, speaks English better than most of you, mm -hmm. me. He's a, he's a brilliant man about the, the English language. So they know us well. We know them less well. But what we also know is that they want, most of these people now in office want to make a deal precisely because they know us well. Um, on the issue of, of the APAC and the lobby question, this is a controversial issue. You hardly can talk about it in this country. And 
nobody wants to mention the way we've talked about it to some degree because somehow it will seem simplistic that there are these group of people out there that want to destroy the U.S. government, uh, guided by the Prime Minister of, of, of Israel. I don't think any of us who've dealt with Israel, who've dealt with uh, this city, <coughs> who've dealt with APAC, or uh, who've dealt with the U.S. Senate, think that so simplistically, or consider that somehow if you're against APAC, you're against, you're an anti-Semite. There's nothing like that going on. There is something going on, though, that Israel's interests are challenged. They perceive them as challenged by what the president would like to do with Iran. We think, and we, we drafted a letter from uh, seven, nine former U.S. ambassadors to Israel and four former undersecretaries of state uh, who have worked with Israel and defended Israel's interests for their, our entire career. And this letter basically said to the leadership of the Congress on both sides, that, look, we have defended and worked for Israel's security for our entire professional lives. And we can assure you that is the cornerstone of U.S. policy. We can also assure you that we are so convinced in the value of this particular agreement, if we can reach it, it will unquestionably improve the security of Israel. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think there's some Israelis who aren't there yet, but that's the argument we make. And I, I want to be assured that that's the way we think. Any other? I th just, there's one other, I mean, there's two other additional points to make. One is, forget what we think is going on inside Iraq. All, this deal and the subsequent one have to be based on deeds. The question about who thinks what is irrelevant. Okay, so. And, and I think, you know, demonstrable deeds, this is the distrust and verify approach. Um, and um, uh, it's pretty clear in this deal that we have not only frozen the program for the period of the six months, but, but taken a rather substantial step backwards, okay? So, you know, that's, it's really important. The other thing which we haven't talked about at all uh, in this whole session, but which is central to this, is the deal as compared to what? Um, I can tell you that during the Bush administration, the White House tried very, very, very hard, pushed the Pentagon to develop an attack plan against Iran. And the Pentagon planners when they develop these plans, they calculate a, a number of 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 2, whatever. Uh, likelihood that U.S. interests would be met under a particular plan. And despite very strong pressure from the White House, they could not produce a plan that re reached an acceptable level of, um, of uh, achieving of, of, the, of the U.S. goals. Um, that's us. Uh, you, you know, knowing, you know, that Israeli capability is a fraction of that. So the question is, if we don't reach a plan, what are the options? Iran continues on the road it's been and gets, in the best case, screwdriver away from a bomb, the Japan situation. Uh, Iran goes further and becomes an explicit nuclear power after which we have a nuclear Middle East. Saudi Arabia follows Egypt, da da da, da. Uh, And third, you have a war, either one that the U.S. leads or worse for Israel, that Israel starts and drags the U.S. in, which will not only, in my view, transform the U.S.-Israeli relationship for a long, long time, but also, in my view, and I think I can support it, be catastrophic for us, for the region, and for Israel. Go ahead, Yes, you, you, you had yeah. one. I'm curious about having deals with countries that have- T tell, tell your name. Yeah, nasty surrogates, uh -huh. nasty things. In, in the case of Cuba, we didn't get out anywhere because their surrogates were messing up, you know, Latin America, Africa. That, that's part of why I saw it. 
Russia, it was sluggish. China's interesting case, Maoist movement all over, we open up China. But is opening up a, a serious deal, or maybe it is. Maybe this is opening up by Iran. So we can sort of, you know, not put pressure on this activity being done by nasty surrogates in the region and around the world. Uh, can I really address that <clears throat> without being uh, Pollyannish about it at all? The reality is, I talked about the fact that there are a lot of people in Iran who vote against the establishment every time they get an opportunity. And it's not just out of peak. Or so. They want, Iranians <clears throat> are truly upset about the fact that they, as a proud nation, 2,500 years of history, having run an empire themselves, are suddenly treated like a little pariah state, stuck off in the corner. They have no access to the world. They, Iran is a westward-looking, sophisticated culture that actually craves involvement, engagement, and, and the like. And if you give them that opportunity through a deal like this, where in fact they're given the opportunity to sort of rejoin the world, you might be very surprised what happens after that. That in fact, I think if the, if the Revolutionary Guards are really worried about a deal with the United States, it's not because they think that the nuclear program is their baby and it's going to be hurt by this. It's because they know what follows. That basically Iran is suddenly then free to open up to the rest of the world and engage in a way that the Re Revolutionary Guard is not in control of everything. And you know this is not something you can prove or put a timeline on it, but the reality of it, I think, is very, very true, and in fact, is quite predictable. And it's, it's something that I think we shouldn't disregard. Again, uh, I don't want to make it more optimistic than it deserves, but in reality, that's what the hardliners in Iran are really worried about, is starting a process that takes them away from the kind of stultifying relationship that they've had, and in their lack of success in running the government, that's going to come to people's attention even more than it has in the past. Um, why don't I take a couple more questions together? <coughs> Did you have something? Yeah. Um, given what Jessica Matthews said about this, uh, how should I put it? There was an Iranian immigrant group that recently said that Iran has secret facilities that need to be known. And given Iran's recent history of having facilities that are secret, quote unquote, facilities that they have been exposed in the past, there are many immigrant groups. Aren't the words you use like cheating and deviousness, aren't they all very real and very, what do you call it, should we say, possible that this is what's behind Iran doing? Ideally, we all like, we all would like to see a deal made in agreement, and things would definitely, the world definitely would be much better had we had an agreement, but given Iran's history of deviousness, cheating, et cetera, isn't that something that we should be alert to? Yes, Absolutely. yes. Um, it certainly doesn't help them to have more inspectors traipsing around the country. Um, it's, and, and certainly having full access to the two large known enrichment sites. Enrichment is hard to hide because it takes a very physically large space and it takes a lot of electricity. And so, um, we have some reasonable confidence about that there's not a large a centrifuge plant uh, or even more, uh, I mean, centrifuge plant for enrichment hidden. But we can't be, but it, it, be sure. Other facilities, wep more weapons related facilities are much easier to hide, much easier. So it's possible. It's. And, and here I guess I go back to the earlier point about, you know, understanding them. It's a, it, it's a little hard to understand why they would believe that they could bring the whole world's attention, focus, glare onto them, invite it in, in effect, with this deal, um, convince everybody that we, um, uh, that, you know, assert that they, don't have this program, 
with so much more intrusive inspections and monitoring in the country uh, and at the same time believe they could um, keep an entire program uh, secret. You could, I mean, I could imagine them keeping a facility or two and part of what needs to be done in the final deal, there's some facilities that are not covered at Parchin in particular that we believe they're doing weapons related R&D in. It's, um, it's just, it would be very, very hard to explain and I think it's extremely unlikely that you could get for, through an entire, you know, uranium, remember we're now gonna be inspecting their mines, their mills, <laughs> there's the known at least, centrifuge production plants and then get all the way through and then get to where you would feel comfortable about testing a weapon, it's, it would be extremely hard to do under these conditions, much harder than where they were. Mm. So they would have to believe that they're that good at it that they can buffalo the entire international community and the IAEA give them much more access to the country and keep this entire program uh, um, and that uh, secret. And then that, that having pissed off the entire international community, that would be better for them than to have a small number of weapons. Uh, well, uh, on that note, um, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I think it's uh, thanks to Jessica and Barry for what they did. And uh, we'll hope to stay tuned and we'll come back when the deal is done and everybody's happy and we're at peace with the world.